welcome everyone to the 2022-2024 ISCC PEG Scholars Presentation. I am Dr. Rebecca Kronk, the external co-chair for ISCC PEG. This session is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the ISC ISCC PEG website. You will notice that the chat has been disabled, but we encourage your questions. So please use the question and answer icon that you can see on the screen, and we will monitor that throughout the presentations. The ISCC PEG Scholars Program is an essential part of the mission of ISCC PEG. This program provides exposure to the broader genomics community and experts in the field with the opportunity to work on a genetics or genomics related educational project under the mentorship of the ISCC PEG member. This appointment is for two years. Today, we have the wonderful opportunity to hear from two of our scholars. The first will be Ava Willoughby. Ava is from Ohio State University College of Medicine and her mentor has been Dr. Barbara O'Brien from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. The second, um, the second presentation today will be from Molly Felix, who is from the Com Virginia Commonwealth University and is receiving her master's in genetic counseling. Her mentors have been Vinaya Murthy from Indiana University School of Medicine and Ebony Madden, Madden from the Training Diversity and Health Equity Office at NA, NHGRI. It is my pleasure now to turn this time over to Dr. O'Brien so that she can introduce Ava Willoughby. Thank you very much. Good, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Ava Willoughby. Um, Ava uh, graduated last spring from the Genetic Counseling Program of Ohio State University College of Medicine. She is now a genetic counselor at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I am her mentor. My name is um, Dr. Barbara O'Brien. Um, I'm a maternal fetal medicine geneticist, um, previously from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and recently um, changed positions to South Shore Medical Center um, in Weymouth. Um, Ava will present her talk today entitled Provider Practices and Perceived Barriers Towards Counseling on Reproductive Options for High-Risk Individuals. Ava? Yes, thank you so much, Barb. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So yes, like Barb mentioned, um, I'll be provi er, um, presenting my project that her and I work together um, on provider practices and perceived barriers towards counseling on reproductive options for high-risk individuals. Um, so today we'll go through the background of this study, the specific aims that we were hoping to address, um, the study design, research questions that we were asking from, um, from the survey data that we'll get back, um, as well as some preliminary data from um, providers within Ohio. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about um, a discussion and future directions for this type of study. Um, so the primary focus of our study is on providers that see patients um, within the setting of future or, or current pregnancies that are, are at high risk for conditions, um, especially within the background of genetic conditions, since we are um, specifically interested in genetics. And of course, there is a lot of reproductive options available for patients or partners within these scenarios. Um, for a future pregnancy, this can often look like um, the options of having a gamete donor so sperm or an egg donor, um, using in vitro fertilization along with pre-implantation pre genetic testing, which is essentially just harvesting eggs from mom, fertilizing um, with dad's sperm, and then um, doing genetic testing on the resultant embryos and only implanting those without the, the genetic condition. Um, and then there's, of course, also the option to adopt instead. 
um, or ha to have a natural pregnancy knowing the potential risk for a future genetic condition um, with or without some form of prenatal testing during pregnancy. Um, and then for a current pregnancy that's found to be at high risk, um, the different options include termination, carrying that pregnancy to term in either um, parenting or placing that pregnancy up for adoption. Um, and then for certain conditions that can be detected during pregnancy, there is fetal therapy available. So for example, um, if a pregnancy was found to have spina bifida. And of course, for many of these options, um, timely counseling and any referrals that would be needed is often very imperative, um, both for, for fetal and mom health, um, but also due to institutional um, and policy barriers that might be in place that keep uh, patients from being able to access certain options after a certain time point or in different scenarios. Um, and of course, there's a lot of different factors that can influence um, a patient or a partner's access to these different um, options and comprehensive counseling on them. Um, of course, those being training of providers, so whether the provider um, is equipped to understand and explain a certain option to their patient. Um, provider attitudes and beliefs can definitely play a role as well. Um, if they have a certain preconceived notion about um, a certain reproductive option that might um, change the way they bring it up or when they bring up a certain option to their patient. Um, of course, patient experiences and their own attitudes can also play a role in this. Sometimes they're very vocal about um, maybe wanting a biological child, so maybe a provider wouldn't um, really offer the option of adoption or gamete donors, for example. Um, there's also, like we sort of mentioned, institutional and policy barriers that could um, make certain options not um, able to be discussed or not be able to be accessed within that state um, or after a certain time point. Um, and then with any area of health, social determin of determinants of health of the patient um, absolutely goes into whether a patient has access to the proper clinic um, or if there's financial concerns with these different options, um, that definitely plays a role as well. Research within the space of determining um, counseling practices for reproductive options has largely been in the context of unintended pregnancies rather than um, high risk or, or genetic condition type of pregnancies. But the research that has been done in this space has definitely found uh, variability between clinics as well as providers in what type of options they're providing their patients and how comprehensive those um, the counseling on those options are and how often they're giving uh, the proper referrals to their patients as well. Um, but like I mentioned, there's a current research gap specifically for reproductive options counseling practices for high risk or or genetic pregnancies. Um, so that's where we hope our, our study sort of comes into place. Um, and we're hoping to investigate um, different counseling practices that providers have um, when they see a patient in a high risk future or, or current pregnancy. Um, and we also hope to compare those practices between different cohorts of providers that we'll be collecting with the study, um, whether that be genetic versus non-genetic providers that see patients in this space. Um, we'll be recruiting from both Ohio, where I practice, as well as Massachusetts, where Barb practice. Um, and we can compare practices between those two states, at least as sort of a pilot study. Um, and then we'll also be asking demographic information about practice settings um, and patient populations. So that can definitely be cohorts that we can compare as well. And ultimately, we also hope to identify the barriers to comprehensive counseling. So if a provider isn't offering a certain option to all of their patients, um, why might that be? And is there an, an area for us to, to um, intervene? Um, so as far as the study design goes, um, as I alluded to, we're hoping to collect both um, current prenatal genetic counselors and current maternal fetal medicine clinicians, both within Ohio and Massachusetts, and we're using multiple different methods or have already used multiple different methods to recruit patients for this study. Um, we actually recently presented to the Ohio Fetal Medicine Collaborative, um, so that's where our preliminary data is coming from. Um, and the survey is completely through this red cap survey. Um, like I mentioned, we'll be asking demographic information, um, not only about the provider themselves, but also their practice setting, how long they've been in practice, um, as well as their patient population um, insurance coverage. Um, and then we'll also ask them some general practices, as well as attitudes towards reproductive options counseling, so just broad um, understanding of, of their comfort levels and which they, they offer their patients. Um, and then we'll also be digging a little bit more into with the survey whether um, state-level abortion restrictions have had any impact on their counseling practices. 
Um, and then finally, we present um, the, the providers that take the survey with four different high-risk future or current pregnancy situations, um, and they're prompted to answer questions about their counseling practices and identify any barriers. Um, the different patient scenarios that we that we present to the providers are, um, first of all, two partners that are found to both be carriers for Tay-Sachs disease, um, so a future pregnancy being at risk for a genetic condition. Um, and then the, the current pregnancy situations include a pregnancy diagnosed with trisomy 18, a pregnancy diagnosed with trisomy 21, and a pregnancy diagnosed with open spina bifida. Um, and then depending on the scenario, they are um, prompted to answer how often they counsel on different options that would be available to a patient in that setting. Um, so, so for the future uh, pregnancy, that could be adoption, gammy donors, IVF, natural pregnancy. And then for those current pregnancy um, scenarios, the options are um, caring to term and parenting with, with possible postnatal support, um, carrying the pregnancy to term and placing up for adoption, um, or terminating the pregnancy. And then with spina bifida, also fetal surgery as well. Um, and then if they don't select that, they always counsel on an option depending on the scenario, um, they will be prompted to answer if there's any certain barriers that they think keep them from being able to discuss that option with every patient in that scenario. Um, and that's being used via a checkbox option, um, but there's also the ability to say other and, and fill in um, what the barriers they, they perceive to be. And then the different research questions that we want to ask of the data is that, um, of course, both descriptive and inferential. Um, and as far as descriptive goes, um, that's sort of what we've done so far just with our preliminary data. But we're hoping to just see which reproductive options generally providers feel comfortable counseling patients on. So what um, in their training are they well equipped to, um, to counsel a patient on? Um, and then which options are most and least often counseled on in each scenario? Are there certain options that maybe need more training in their, um, in their career development? Um, and then what are the barriers being identified and, and what can we really do to intervene with those, if, if anything? Um, and then as far as inferential goes, as we start building our cohorts of different types of providers that take this survey, um, we're hoping to see if there's any differences in frequency of counseling on certain options uh, between, the, between the different scenarios. So between um, trisomy 18 and trisomy 21, for example, um, but also between the different cohorts of the, of the types of providers that we have. Um, and then also, is there any differences in the barriers that these providers are reporting? Is it only um, non-genetics providers that feel this certain way? Is it only um, providers that see a pa patients in a certain setting that feel um, a certain way or feel a certain barrier more so than others? Um, and then there are, are also some um, free text questions throughout the survey. So um, we'll also be drawing some, some um, thematic type of, type of um, analysis. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we were able to get some preliminary data from the Maternal Fetal Medicine Collaborative here in Ohio. Um, and so, so going back to those general um, broad questions, as far as the reproductive, reproductive options that those providers felt comfortable counseling patients on generally, all of them were comfortable talking about termination with their, with their patients. Um, and there's a little bit more variability with the comfort levels for placing a current pregnancy up for adoption. Um, counseling patients on utilizing donor gametes, um, and then to a lesser extent, IVF, um, and then for a future pregnancy, adoption as an alternative. Um, and then we also asked them what type of roles they feel providers like them should have in this decision-making process for their patients. And everyone agreed that providing information on the different options, discussing the risks and benefits of them, and uh, being able to refer their patients out to other providers as needed um, was definitely something, um, a, a, a role that these providers should be playing. Um, and then there's a little bit more variability with the other types of um, support roles that these types of providers can have um, in these conversations conversations. Um, and so looking at the frequency of counseling on certain options based on the scenarios, um, in the scenario where we um, where we had two partners that are found to be carriers of the same condition, there were six providers that um, frequently see patients in this scenario. Um, all of them always discuss IVF with PGT with their patients, as well as having a natural pregnancy um, and explaining what that might look like um, and what the risk is to, to the patient or to the um, future pregnancy. Um, 
there's a little bit more of variability when talking about um, adoption as an alternative or utilizing gamete donors. Um, one of the barriers I identified really for both of them was that sometimes like I sort of mentioned earlier, their per, their patient will say um, upfront that they want a biological child. So this is often sometimes um, options that that providers don't feel is, is applicable to their patient. So it's it's um, tailoring the reproductive options counseling to their patient, which makes absolute sense. Um, with adoption, there's also the barrier identified of personal knowledge of this process, um, as well as some uh, more personal biases towards the adoption process being a very difficult process for families that that um, that pursue that, or assuming that their patients already know that this is an option for them. And then in the scenario where a current pregnancy is diagnosed with spina bifida, there were eight providers that routinely see patients in this setting. Um, most, if not all, counsel on fetal intervention as well as postnatal intervention, um, and a large majority of them also um, counsel on termination. The one that did not as, as frequent um, did not state what type of barrier would be for that. Um, but there's a lot of, of variability on, on um, counseling practices for placing a uh, pregnancy up for adoption or, or placing a child with spina bifida up for adoption after they're born. Um, and there's also in the, in the free text option with these providers, they were stating a concern about what the adoption process would look like for a child with extensive medical needs. And then we saw a very similar trend um, with current pregnancies diagnosed with trisomy 18 or trisomy 21 as well. Um, a majority of providers in both scenarios either don't or only sometimes counsel on the option to place a child up with these conditions place the child up for adoption with these conditions. Um, again, with personal knowledge being one of the barriers identified for both of them. Um, and at trisomy 18, especially, there was that, um, again, the concern about placing up a ch child for adoption that has extensive medical needs as well. Um, we also see that there's some variability in the conversation about termination for trisomy 21 versus um, trisomy 18. Um, for trisomy 21, um, one of the barriers identified was that there's no access to this, um, which I thought was interesting in the context of there being a law in Ohio that bans um, abortion of fetuses that are known to have a trisomy 21 diagnosis. So I imagine this may be um, what that was referring to. Um, and then there's also... in in the trisomy 20 community, a lot of advocacy for that. Um, families don't want to talk about termination when their child's diagnosed with trisomy 21. Um, so there's definitely some personal bias if, if providers are sort of involved with that community um, and understand what it looks like long term. Um, so going back to the trend that we identified about a possible knowledge gap or maybe just a discomfort counseling on postnatal adoption for, for medically complex kids, so kids with spina bifida, kids with trisomy 20, 21, kids with trisomy 18, um, perhaps there is a place for additional education or maybe resource development to educate providers um, on these different organizations that do specialize in, in adoption for kids with special needs. And actually with trisomy 21, there is a specific um, organization that that um, uh, organizes adoption for kids with, with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, this National Down Syndrome Adoption Network. Um, and there's actually a long wait list to, um, to adopt a child with, with trisomy 21. So it's definitely an option for families that seems to be underutilized or undercounseled on um, when, when a current pregnancy is diagnosed. So definitely a possible area for, for intervention. Um, but overall, like I said, that was just um, very preliminary data from Ohio, only nine providers so far. Um, so overall, we hope to gather more data and, and eventually inform the development of interventions to overcome any identified barriers to improve counseling practices and ultimately improve patient care as well. Um, and then hopefully we this is leading to, to other studies that is looking at implementation of those barrier-specific interventions. There, of course, needs to also be more studies in patient insights in this. Um, so, so how families feel after this type of counseling, what type of information they wish they had that wasn't addressed, um, sort of quantitative as, as well as qualitative studies um, into that. Um, and then more chart review studies to actually be able to, to look in the medical record, see what options um, patients are being counseled on rather than than just um, asking how, how frequently they're, they're um, counseled on by the providers themselves.
Um, so where we're at in this process, um, we've been able to get IRB um, approval here at Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is why we're able to um, recruit Ohio providers at this time. Um, we're still pending IRB approval at BIDMC, um, but we're also hoping to recruit a resident there that is interested in this type of work um, to, to help us out and, and get that moving. Um, of course, like I said, the recruitment's sort of still in process. Um, it's in process in Ohio, and then it will be once once um, IRB is approved at BIDMC. Um, and then overall data analysis and manuscript would be um, the last steps there. So thank you all for, for listening to the work that Barb and I have been doing. Um, a special thank you to all of my study team and, and especially Barb for being my mentor um, through the scholars program. Um, and then of course, um, ISPEG leadership as well, Donna and um, formerly Richard and now Rebecca. So welcome to, to, to ISPEG, Rebecca. Um, and then also thank you to Donna Lane, who was the um, the my genetic counseling program director that, that got me in touch with this program and um, let me know about it and helped me apply. So um, thank you to everyone that's gotten me to this point and um, for you all for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. So this is just a friendly reminder that if folks have questions, they can put them in the chat. Um, I also see that someone in the audience, uh, Kara Weissman, has their hand raised, so we may be able to do that verbally. But um, for all others, uh, please utilize the Q&A function. Go ahead and take it away, Kara, or Kara. All right. So, Ava, we've got our first question. Are you up for it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, looks like this question um, asks, um, is there any correlation between the duration that a counselor has been practicing and their willingness or unwillingness to discuss certain medical options? I think that's definitely a possibility and one that we do hope to investigate. Um, the demographics that providers fill out um, also include years of practice. So um, that could be something that we compare and compare to um, how frequent they are counseling on certain options in different scenarios. Um, I think that's a really great research question to include. And just for a second one, Ava, um, I'm curious myself, what brought you to study this particular topic? Um, so when um, so the reason I applied to the ISPEC Scholar Program was that I've always had um, an interest in provider education and um, um, collaborating with non-genetics providers so that genetics can really be embedded within um, patient care. So I applied to this program as part of the application program. Um, we developed a project that we would be interested in. Um, and the project I developed was um, related to carrier screening, because I do think um, carrier screening and and reproductive options counseling is, is one way that um, genetics is really embedded within primary care. Um, so many people are being offered carrier screening, um, not by a genetics professional. So that was something that I was just interested in. Um, so because it was within that reproductive space, I was matched with Barb and we sort of worked together to um, to create this project. I actually now work um, within the cardiac ICU. So I've sort of developed um, a lot of interest in the cardiac space. So I'm, I'm sort of developing my career and um, taking on projects as, as interest comes. Thank you. I'll continue to monitor the Q&A, um, but unless there anything, I think we can keep today's program rolling. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, Ava and Barbara both. And we can move on to, I believe it will be Vinaya's introduction. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our second scholar, Molly Felix. Um, so Molly is a graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University where she received her master's in genetic counseling um, this past spring. Her ISCC PEG research project is focused on genetic counselors' attitudes and perceptions in language discordant patient encounters. Um, her ISCC PEG mentors were Dr. Ebony Madden and myself. Um, Molly is now a practicing genetic counselor in pediatric genetic counseling at the Genetic Center at Children's Hospital of Orange County. So welcome to California. And so Dr. Madden is a program director at NHGRI in the Training Diversity and Health Equity Office. And I also had a recent transition from Indiana University, and I'm currently working at the University of California, San Francisco. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Molly. 
Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Murthy, and I'm happy to be in California as well. I think it's especially um, a relevant place to practice in the context of some of the research that I'll be talking about today. Um, all right, so looks like everyone is able to see my screen all right. What my research was focused on during my time with the ISCC PEG program was looking at how genetic counselors specifically adapt their clinical practice to um, not sharing a common la language with their patients, as well as how that actually impacts the quality of counseling that's received by the patient. Um, my mentors, as Dr. Murthy previously mentioned, are her and Dr. Madden, as well as uh, additional participation from the ISCC PEG Health Equity and Community Engagement Project Group, who's been very supportive um, and engaging in terms of interest as to what our language discordant patients are experiencing and the quality of education um, and information that they receive during their appointments. So overall, what this project was, um, the goal was to understand more specifically what strategies genetic counselors are employing during these sessions and um, understanding more specifically how well these patients are understanding the information that's being received by them. So for the focus of this um, survey, it was looking at genetic counselor perceptions and patients were not directly surveyed due to time and IRB constraints. So um, our understanding of the patient experience is inherently somewhat limited there. However, we were able to go ahead and proceed with an observational online quantitative survey, which recruited 56 participants from all over the United States and Canada, which were then subsequently analyzed using descriptive statistics. So before I proceed any further, I wanted to define language discordance as um, a term describing what occurs when a patient and their healthcare provider lack proficiency in a shared common language. So this survey that um, myself, as well as Dr. Murthy and Madden designed was offered primarily in English, um, exclusively in English. So um, for the purpose of this talk, we're referring to language discordance as non-English speaking patients. To provide some background about why we wanted to pursue this topic in particular was because language discordance is well associated in previous literature with suboptimal health outcomes for patients. Um, the literature on this topic is quite extensive, but some of the highlights in terms of negative impact on patient are missed medical appointments, health communication anxiety, which has been subsequently linked to um, poor recall of patient education, lower awareness about their preventative health care options, including access to services like genetic counseling, delayed access to receiving appropriate referrals to specialists, which subsequently de de uh, delays diagnosis, and then additionally, um, language discordant position, patients have, after that entire um, process, an increased risk to receive a misdiagnosis. So when we were looking at the previous literature about how language discordance um, impacts um, the genetic education sphere in general, there was very limited information in regards to genomic education. So pre previous studies were mainly um, qualitative in nature, analyzing themes brought up by um, participants during interviews and surveys. And additionally, a lot of this prior literature we, that we have out there is looking at um, language discordance more in the context of minority patient involvement rather than um, looking more specifically at the language component. So to provide a brief overview of our results, my results were a little bit more intensively covered in my prior talk, which is available, as well as my slides. And additionally, if you have any um, further interest in the data or the analysis that was conducted afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me. But to provide a brief overview for the purpose of today's talk, 
Our characteristics in this project were very representative of what we see in genetic counselors in general. So predominantly a younger provider age demographic, predominantly female, um, white in terms of identification and race and ethnicity, and a decent um, distribution of specialties as well which is um, additionally representative of what we see in general with cancer, prenatal and pediatric and general practice practitioners comprising the majority of respondents. Additionally, many of the respondents in uh, this survey were in their, within their first few years of clinical practice, which is showing us that a lot of the individuals who took this survey may be a bit more reflective of what's currently taking place within genetic counseling education and provides us a little bit more insight as to how well our um, genetic counseling programs are preparing providers right now. So some highlights from our previous survey before I get it a little bit into um, what our statistical associations showed us as well as other recommendations is that language discordance is something that the vast majority of genetic counselors regularly encounter in their clinical practice with only one of our respondents mentioning that they'd never encountered a language discordant patient appointment. Secondly, genetic counselors tend to employ a variety of adaptations to facilitate their patient understanding, which have been previously suggested in the literature, such as changing our sentence structure, employing shorter sentences, adapting word choice, more intense utilization of visual aids, and just increasing the amount of time that we spend with the patient. So results showed that genetic counselors tend to employ all of these, but not necessarily in equal measure. And then thirdly, the working relationship between genetic counselors and interpreters is overall positive. So the majority of um, genetic counselors do tend to report positive experience with their interpreters, as well as um, more experiencing more positive encounters with interpretive services compared to negative encounters. Additionally, our survey did identify some problem points in which counselors do not always feel um, confident that they are obtaining informed consent with these patients that are language discordant. So about 25% of our respondents raised concerns about their ability to obtain informed consent in every patient appointment. And especially in terms of the importance of informed consent when we're discussing things like um, extensive genomic testing, um, discussing testing that can potentially impact other family members as well, the lack of attainment of informed consent can have some pretty large implications for families. Additionally, discrepancies between perceived patient understanding do still exist between language discordant and concordant appointments. So, Providers do tend to perceive that their language discordant patients are still understanding considerably less than their language concordant patients um, at the conclusion of the appointment. So um, in review of previous literature, one of the interesting things that we found was that even when patients are provided with genomic education from providers and specialists who are not necessarily specialized in genetics, those patients, if they're language concordant, will still do better than language discordant patients that are being educated by a genetics specialist or genetics provider. So that discrepancy is pretty significant. Lastly, high levels of frustration are still being reported in the majority of respondents when they're um, working with interpretive services. So while that relationship is overall positive, the majority of people are still having those um, frustrating experiences or negative encounters with interpreters. So what we wanted to do was take a little bit of a closer look at our data that was previously collected to see what additional findings um, our data could tell us in terms of where to go next with this information and what sort of um, solutions or new approaches that we could potentially develop to help address these issues. So to start with interpreter modality choice, we know that about 98 participants are now utilizing telehealth services in their counseling practice, despite in-person interpretation being the preferred modality. 
So I think this is quite reflective of what's happening in healthcare in general with patient appointments trending towards telehealth, especially following the COVID-19 pandemic. So it seems like this is now the most universally utilized tele um, interpretive service, although it's not necessarily the ones that um, providers may prefer. Additionally, the preference for in-person interpretation um, is statistically significant for genetic counselors. And this preference tends to be stronger for individuals practicing as pediatric and prenatal genetic counselors compared to individuals that are practicing in oncology. So this may be reflective of additional challenges that these specialties are experiencing in terms of communicating with their patients. But ultimately, it um, stands as a point in which further research could be helpful to understand more specifically what's happening. Finding two was taking a little bit of a closer look at the specific adapt adaptations that genetic counselors are using to communicate with the, this language discordant population. And additionally, we briefly touched on those different aids and adaptations that have been used. Most consistently reported adaptation by genetic counselors is just increasing the amount of time that they tend to spend with their patient. And I found this result to be interesting because in many clinical settings, this adaptation can result in a lot of statistical or logistical challenges, um, excuse me, because we're not always in control of patient schedule and how much time that we can actually devote to an individual patient, ensuring that um, that education is adequately provided. Additionally, newer providers, so genetic counselors that have been practicing for less than two years, tend to lean on this adaptation significantly more strongly than their more experienced counterparts. So this could potentially represent a trend that's occurring in our current education, be reflective of something that new providers um, tend to do as they are developing into practitioners, or potentially um, it could provide a point of concern as to the level of depth um, and coverage that our more experienced providers are giving. Some other findings of interest in terms of statistically significant relationships, um, no significant relationship was identified between the work setting that the genetic counselor operates in and the use of adaptations in the setting, uh, the session. So for individuals who are working in, for example, an academic facility versus a for-profit hospital, these um, this variety of work setting does not seem to have a strong impact as to what genetic counselors decide to do to address this language discordance. Additionally, genetic counselors of Asian or African-American ancestry were significantly more likely to select word choice as an adaptation compared with um, providers of white or Hispanic ancestry. So our um, data for race and ethnicity was still somewhat limited as the majority of our respondents were white, but I still think that's an interesting finding to note. So in terms of what we know so far with the data gathered and our limited prior knowledge on how language discordance impacts the genomic landscape, uh, there were some specific approaches and educational approaches that may potentially be helpful in addressing these discrepancies. So in terms of accommodations for increased session time, some of the approaches that we might consider recommending for providers or to take would be to block additional time for patients whenever possible. And again, I understand that there's a lot of constraints on the feasibility of that for many people. Additionally, we can consider language as a factor in the clinic schedule. If we're able not scheduling patients back to back that um, require a bit more extensive counseling in terms of language barrier, as well as factoring in the patient indication for why they're coming to see genetics. And additionally, this may be something that's ultimately not entirely in control of the provider seeing the patient. So um, perhaps this research 
what we know so far may indicate a need for um, different institutional policies about how language discordance is managed in the clinical setting to ensure that those patients are receiving the same quality of care. And then lastly, something that's a little bit more pert pertinent to our um, specific interest group is this may be an area for which we could potentially share language resources that facilitate um, a more streamlined approach to these language discordance sessions. So for example, um, sharing intake forms that we have available to us um, in different languages, especially for those parts of the counseling process and session that tend to be a bit more streamlined. For example, um, regardless of the indication, a lot of cancer genetic counseling appointments tend to ask some of those same intake questions in regards to family history of cancer, age at diagnosis, et cetera. Additionally, providing the patient ahead of time or after time with written information about what transpired during the appointment. So the testing options that will be discussed or were discussed in writing to help the patient um, see that information multiple times in review may be helpful to um, closing that knowledge gap for these patients a little bit more. And then additionally, I think that this data suggests that there may be room for improvement in terms of the provider relationship with our interpreters. So recommendations might include contracting with interpreters wherever possible, letting them know ahead of time what will be discussed in the session, what's important to communicate to the patient, and the main takeaways that we wanna make sure that the patient understands at the conclusion of the appointment. Additionally, this may be a space in which we could foster relationships with interpreting professional organizations to better integrate them into the genomics education workspace. So there's quite a bit of previous literature that does suggest that um, interpreting professionals have interest in um, continuing genomics education and don't necessarily feel that um, the certification process or the, the initial education that's required to become an interpreter necessarily pre prepares them for these more complex appointments. So this could be an area in which integrating and uh, facilitating that working relationship with these professional organizations may be mutually beneficial in terms of uh, interpreters being better able to request resources that they need to be um, successful in interpreting these appointments, and then additionally having the interpreter perspective when generating new resources and new educational materials that are intended for provider and clinical use. Continuing education resources additionally may be a piece of this. Um, a pilot study conducted in 2021 suggested that um, interpreters do tend to retain a significant amount of information from genetics educational workshops that does impact their practice and how they interpret specific terms and words, especially when encountering a new genetic indication that they haven't previously seen. Um, so that education component of it does seem to have a la lasting impact on clinical practice. And then lastly, advocacy for appropriate interpretive services does seem to play a role in how well our language discordant patients um, are receiving this information and receiving informed consent, especially for those um, specific specialties where they may not be receiving their preferred interpretive service. It may be important to advocate more strongly for appropriate interp interpretive services for the indication and allowing for um, the appropriate amount of time to complete the appointment in general. So overall, that was a brief overview of some of the additional research and suggestions that um, have been um, developed since taking a closer look at the conclusion of the study and analyzing the data. Um, and I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge my mentors from Virginia Commonwealth University, as well as the ICC, ICC PEG group. And then as well, of course, thanking all of our study participants who took the time to um, really help us develop that new database of information. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to listen to this important topic and um, for your consideration of how we can better be serving our language discordant patients.
Thank you. Thank you, Molly. That was wonderful. Um, we actually have um, a handful of questions in the chat. If you are ready, we're going to try and see if we can get to all of them. Excellent. I will do my best. Yeah. All right. So the first one for you is, do you know if dealing with discordance between patient and providers are equally difficult comparing in-person appointments and telehealth appointments? Um, this uh, questioner says that it seems that the use of closed captioning or similar technology during telehealth could make them more effective, but what are your thoughts or what does the data show? That's a good question. And when perceiving patient understanding, we didn't necessarily group those interpretive modalities differently. So we have an understanding that um, the amount of information that these patients are processing is to decreased when working through an interpreter, but weren't able to necessarily gain any additional information about um, how much the interpretive modality tends to impact the patient. So I think it's something that requires a lot of ongoing research. And additionally, when we were asking about um, telehealth interpretive modalities that didn't distinguish between, you know, uh, an interpreter that's being accessed via the phone or via a telehealth video call that may have some of those additional services such as closed captioning. So for additional research, I think that distinction would likely be important. Yeah. And I'm going to fuse two questions together because I think that they touch on a similar um, topic. Um, and it's essentially, did providers or your respondents come up with ways either in the free response questions or in the data to reduce the impact of language discordance? Um, one of the attendees uh, brings up AI, for example. One thing that I thought of is providers who are actually bilingual, for example. So in the data or with your respondents, were there any suggestions that could reduce the impact of language discordance? Yes, so in our free responses, we did note that there were providers with partial proficiency who would attempt to perform uh, the less complex comp parts of the session using, um, you know, perhaps like an intermediate level of language understanding to collect family history and so forth. And this is something that seems to be a pretty significant um, utilization across the board. However, um, previous research from the interpreter perspective suggests that interpreters don't necessarily appreciate um, when providers do that. So it's something that providers perceive to be helpful, but not necessarily our counterparts uh, within the interpreting realm, which kind of uh, speaks to the need for uh, that continuation of fostering a working relationship with our medical interpreters. And then additionally, um, to touch on the second piece of that question in terms of AI, um, AI wasn't necessarily something that was uh, brought up in free response or addressed with the questions in the survey, just due to the timing um, of when this project began to be developed. It wasn't necessarily something that we were considering as much in the clinical setting as we are now. Thank you. And another one. Have you observed the frequent use of family members or friends as interpreters in practice? And if so, have you looked into the attitudes of providers regarding this practice? So I think you somewhat touched on it, but any more that you would like to say about that idea? Absolutely. So about 23% of our participants responded that they had previously used a family member or a friend in their clinical practice to provide interpretive services. And the overall um, preference that is um, reported by genetic counselors is that they don't necessarily like having to be put in the situation where they're required to do that. So this may potentially be something that's occurring a little bit more in those prenatal and pediatric situations, um, but it does seem to be something that's potentially having a negative impact on patient care. That's interesting, thank you. Um, and now I'll open up the floor to anybody who wants to ask a live question, um, because there are no more in the chat, but I think we do have one from the audience. Hey, Molly, nice job. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on being a new grad. Um, what ways, you know, do you think, um, programs can help with this 
in terms of training students, especially since several of the um, respondents were within their first few years of practice? Absolutely. So I think there is certainly room um, within the provider education realm and genetic counseling programs to assist um, new grads and new genetic counselors to better be able to use visual aids uh, a little bit more confidently. Uh, looking at pre previous research, it seems that the biggest indication on whether or not genetic counselors, especially new grads, are usually using visual aids is just personal preference. So this might potentially indicate that there's not necessarily a standardized training in terms of how to adapt to these sessions, how to confidently use visual aids and other tools that we have at our disposal to um, you know, provide patient education and check for that patient understanding. So potentially a little bit more of a standardized approach in utilizing clinical resources such as visual aids may potentially be something that's of benefit to new grads and genetic counselors in training. Thank you. So I think I can take it from here. I'm Donna Messer-Smith, the other ISCC PEG co-chair, in addition to Rebecca Cronick, who introduced herself earlier. And first of all, I want to put out a big thank you to our two graduating ISCC PEG scholars, Molly and Ava, who did an excellent job with their presentations. And they were being recorded as as we still are, and they'll be posted on the ISCC PEG website uh, in the future. So, uh, and again, thank you so much to our mentors, which makes such a difference in this program and make it possible. So please, um, the participants in the call, if you'd like to uh, consider being a mentor and consider Applying as a scholar, we currently have the applications uh, not open right now, but but we'll um, be looking forward to the future when we can open up the applications again. And we do have another class, class number four, uh, in progress. So please be on the lookout for other announcements uh, with their final presentations uh, at the end of their term, which would be October 2020. So again, congratulations to Molly and Ava, class number three, completing their term as ICC PEG scholars. Um, and we also encourage anyone who may be on the call who's not yet an ISCC PEG member to check for the membership application on the ISCC PEG website. And finally, on behalf of NHGRI and the Education and Community Involvement Branch, we want to thank you for attending. I don't want to forget that our excellent Q&A monitor, um, Cameron Washington, maybe wasn't fully introduced. He is our 2024 to 2026 ASHG NHGRI Genetics Education and Engagement Fellow and also trained as a genetic counselor. So thank you, Cameron. And thank you for our technical crew and also for all of our support from NHGRI. So we wanna thank you, thank all on the call for your engagement in genomics education and stay tuned for additional events. Thank you.